Hello, my name is Mark Simpson, and today I'll be presenting 10 Simplish Rules, How to Design a Poster, Win Friends, and Influence People. The focus of this presentation is on designing a poster, an academic poster, for a networking or convention style event. And this is something that we have to do frequently in the Luskin School when we take our social science research and go from a written text to a visually engaging poster that clearly communicates our ideas. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. This presentation is broken up into two parts. The first is the 10 simple rules that if you follow, you'll have a great eye-catching poster. And then the second part, after we're done with the rules, is we'll look at some examples of some good posters and some not-so-good posters so we can understand what works and what doesn't and maybe even borrow some ideas for our own work. So the first thing we should say is, what, what is a poster? And generally, at least here at Luskin, and this is true for many other academic projects, is a printed poster should communicate your research in a conference-like setting that has a clear visual presentation of your argument and necessary information. And it needs to be understandable to an uninitiated viewer without explanation. The poster should be able to stand on its own and shouldn't require you to be standing there next to it to explain what's going on. And then finally, it's important to keep in mind that this poster is just not your paper at a poster scale. A academic paper is a much different format from a 3x3 poster. And so we're going to have to rearrange the information accordingly. So let's talk about that. So I'm going to, I'm going to outline 10 simple rules that will give you maximum success and happiness now and in the future. So rule number one is know your audience. Poster sessions tend to be have distracted participants and visitors that wander through a crowded, noisy room. So it can be hard to get people's attention. Generally, you have about three to five seconds to gain the attention of a potential viewer. And finally, your writing should be accessible enough to a casual visitor who might not be familiar with your academic focus, but with enough inter information and analysis to engage a more knowledgeable, knowledgeable colleague or professional. So this might look like something where you would say to a child, when we put houses far away from where people work, everyone will drive. And by contrast that to your mom, you can get a little bit more complicated, use bigger words and more nuanced meaning. By separating land uses, i.e. putting single family homes far away from centers of employment, we are encouraging people to drive more. And then finally, the most complicated, if you're talking to your professor or an academic colleague, there is a statistically significant and positive relationship between communities that mandate single-use zoning and total vehicle miles traveled. And so we can see how, for all three of these examples, they're communicating the same point, but with different layers and nuance of information. So as, as a suggestion... I'd say write simply enough for your mom, but with enough data and justification to satisfy your professor. Rule number two is say more with less. More is not always better, and huge blocks of text can be overwhelming and are easily ignored. So if you had an introduction, this is my big idea, with a paragraph of supporting text, Therefore, my big idea is new, exciting, and original. If it's a manageable, manageable size of text, people are much more likely to read it than if you reproduce your paper on the poster. This amount of text is overwhelming, and no one's going to stand in front of a poster and read it. So it's really important to be able to condense down information into digestible sizes. Photos and visual graphics can do a great job at this. And in this photo, 
we see traffic on a LA freeway that really does more to communicate the idea of urban congestion than any thousand word essay could. So I would suggest to keep your poster under 250 words. This might seem like not very much, but you're unlikely to get a, view, a potential viewer to read more than 250 words. And even if they are really interested in reading more about your project, you can always just send them a copy of your, your research and your written work. There's no reason to include everything on the poster. Rule number three is have an awesome title. The title tends to be the biggest thing that's printed on the poster, and if it's eye-catching and clear, it's much more likely to draw someone in to read more about your poster. So you should try to pick a title that's clever, that's likely to engage a passerby, is concise, and that can clearly identify the questions and conclusions you are addressing. So let's say you were doing a project on the relationship between freeways and asthma rates in children. So a boring, academically focused title could be Investigating Disproportionately High Occurrences of Asthma in Children, Rates Coincide with Raised 2.5 PM Levels Adjacent to LA's Freeways. So it's kind of a mouthful. It has all the information in there, but I practically fell asleep halfway through reading it. As a suggestion, a more exciting and awesome title could be Highway to Hell, how LA's freeways are killing children. And again, it's a little bit glib. It's certainly eye-catching, but to put such a clear, provocative title on a poster is going to be much more likely to draw the attention of someone who's walking through a crowded room with many other posters to look at. So as a suggestion, I'd say, keep your title awesome, be clever, just don't be too glib. You can push it a little bit, but not too far. Rule number four is that narrative is supreme. A clear narrative helps organize and frame your research. And it allows you to take a complicated set of social and policy phenomena and develop a progression of relationships that clearly connect your introduction to the conclusion. So what does this look like? If we think about an example like Hansel and Gretel, it has a very clear, concise narrative with a set of actors, with a set of preferences or desires. And the narrative is the thing that leads the viewer from the beginning to the conclusion, from one step to the next. You don't want to leave people to wade through your research and develop their own conclusions. So again, narrative is about going from A to B to C to D. And in the case of Hansel and Gretel, the story can be broken down very easily into four parts. The children go out looking for candy in the woods. An evil witch lures the children with the promise of candy to her house. She captures the children, and they are almost cooked and eaten by the witch, until finally the evil witch is defeated and the children escaped unharmed, presumably with lots of candy. So the thing to keep in mind here is that you have a very clear progression of steps, a clear procession of actors, and who all have their different priorities. In this case, the children are troublemakers out looking for candy, and the witch is an evil demon who wants to eat children. So social sciences are filled with examples of simple stories or anecdotes that can crystallize complicated trends or occurrences. So think about crafting a tale with your own research that is both gripping and informative. Be sure to organize your information to lead the viewer to a conclusion and that any planning or social policy or public health project is as much about telling a story as it is about data and policy. Rule number five is that hierarchy rules. It's important to acknowledge that some information in your research is more important than other data points. Essential information should be featured most prominently on your poster. As a general rule, the bigger the text or the header, the more important the information should be. 
And also keep in mind that it's impossible to include everything in your research on the poster. So much like this pyramid, you should filter information so that the most prominent and important information is on top and is featured most clearly. So again, on a poster, the bigger something is, the more important it should be. This helps you to organize different levels of engagement with the poster so that way someone walking by can choose how much they will read and how much information they can glean. Meaning that your poster should be able to engage viewers regardless of their level of commitment to reading your poster. So focus on your major findings and try not to include everything you know. Rule number six is about creating visual flow. So your poster should be organized in a way that is clear and easy to follow. People tend to read from left to right and then from top to bottom. So therefore the more important information should be placed on the upper portion of the poster. Visual flow of information is closely related to the narrative you are crafting. So how you organize your poster should coincide with how you have crafted your research narrative. And don't be afraid to get creative with how the information is laid out and linked together. Everything does not necessarily have to be from top to bottom and left to right. And here's a list of some important things that you should really consider including in your research poster. Title is by far the most important, and then you're gonna want your name so people know who you are. Introduction, a brief overview, like an executive summary, uh, a restatement of the problem, the methods that you used, and, and the results. And then finally, you should have a really clear conclusion towards the bottom so that someone looking at the poster knows what the takeaway should be from your information that you've presented. And then don't be afraid to include some references, acknowledgments, and your contact information in case someone wants to get in touch with you later. So again, the suggestion is organize your poster so that the flow of visual information coincides with the narrative that you've crafted for your data. Rule number seven is to make your text legible. Typefaces can communicate a mood or suggest an overall tone, so choose one or more wisely. Use no more than three typefaces on a poster because too many typefaces can become distracting and incoherent. White text on a black background can be very difficult to read, so avoid it at all costs. And make sure that your text is appropriately sized. If your text is too small, people won't see it, they won't read it, it becomes much easier to ignore. So as suggestions, use a 72 point size for a title, headers that are 48 point, and body text that is 24 point. Make sure that your poster can be read from, at least primarily from 10 feet away, so it's a good idea to, after you've designed your poster, to print a mock-up and then look at it from different distances to see what kind of information you can see. And then always, 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 use a light background and dark text. It makes it much easier to read. Rule number eight, use colors to enhance your design. You should have three to five colors that you use throughout the poster. Pick them and stick with them. And don't get too crazy about it because they can color can be really distracting. There are two main color profiles that are used in graphic design projects. The first is RGB and the second is CMYK. I won't get into too much detail about these, but suffice it to say if you're working with a print document, you're going to want to use CMYK versus if you're going to be doing a presentation that's just going to live on a screen, you should use RGB. Color should always be used to highlight or emphasize points or text. It can be used to separate and define sections. And perhaps most helpfully, it can associate information from one place to another, simply by picking a color and using it consistently throughout.
Color should never compete with information. So if you have too much color, it can become overwhelming. And again, color should never overwhelm the viewer. If you have too much color, too many colors, it can get very distracting. And then people aren't looking at your research, they're looking at the colors that you've picked. So again, I'd say pick two to, two to five colors to use throughout the poster. If you're having trouble picking a color palette, there's great resources online like colorlovers.com or Adobe Cooler help you pick color formats. And please, please, please don't use the default MS Office colors. They tend to be really boring and more importantly, they read like Microsoft Office colors. So for working professionals who use Microsoft Office, we know what the colors look like, we know what the defaults are, and if you use the default color scheme on your poster, what that tells the viewer is that you haven't bothered to take the time to put your own touch into this work. Rule number nine is that every pixel matters. You need to ensure that every image you include is of sufficient resolution for the scale that you're printing. So what does this mean? Let's say you have this cute photo of this kitten wearing a hat that you want to include in your poster. If the resolution isn't high enough for the size you're printing it at, it's going to look like this, which is like pixelated, muddied, lacking in definition. It just looks really amateurish, like you don't care about your work. So you should really avoid this. As a rule of thumb, all images should have a resolution no less than 270 dpi. That means dots per inch. So how do you determine how big your image needs to be so that it's of proper resolution? It's pretty simple. Determine how big the image will be when it's printed. So in this case, let's say this kitten photo was printed 3 inches by 4 inches. So to know how many pixels or how big the image needs to be in order to print clearly, just take the dimensions and multiply them by 270. So 4 inches times 270 dots per inch would give you 1080 pixels. And then on the left side, 3 inches times 270 dpi would give you 810 pixels. So in order for this kitten photo to be printed clearly, I would need to have at least 1080 by 810 pixels if the final image was going to be 3 inches by 4 inches. So again, Pixelated images looks terrible. You should really avoid them at all costs. Finally, rule 10 is know your software. There are two software suites that are typically used for poster design, Adobe InDesign and Microsoft PowerPoint. Check the CCLE page for tutorials on how to use Adobe InDesign for layout and there's a wealth of information online uh, for both, both of these programs because the more you know about them, the more flexibility you'll have in your final design because the last thing you want to do is fight the software. You want to you use it as a tool and work with it. So as a suggestion, I'd say spend a couple hours on a software tutorial program and familiarize yourself with the programs before getting started. Okay. So now that we've talked about the 10 rules of good poster design, let's look at some examples. So this is a great poster that was designed by an urban planning student about agriculture, urban ag in Los Angeles. And so we can see it has a non-traditional layout with these non-rectilinear lines. Uh, the color scheme is well curated. It flows well together. And finally, there's different levels of engagement. So the title is the biggest thing. It has a image of that chicken in the corner. And then as you dial in and it, things get smaller, there's the table of information, there's quick summary, there's legends. So if I was walking by this poster in a presentation setting, I would know that this is a project that has a chicken, so it's probably about urban agriculture. And that there's just different levels of, of engagement so I could just look at the methodology or the findings or just read the summary. Really great use of hierarchy. Here's another great poster from another 
urban planning student. Great color scheme. I really like how on the bottom of the poster, they, the student has recreated a street scene on campus by blending that green into the landscape. The, prime, the findings are presented on a map that is minimally designed, so the grays are representing the buildings. They're not, e they're not even showing the street outlines. They're just showing the individual scores with those color bands. And then on the left side, there's a great summary of all of the findings. So I see this provocative question in the title up top, and it becomes very clear what the project was on and what the results were. Finally, here's a, another example from another urban planning student, which is showing water management. It was about water management issues in LA. And again, great use of colors. Uh, I really like the summary at the bottom of the page with those physical challenges. It becomes very clear uh, what the issues are. And the findings have been boiled down into a really easy to understand, digestible way. We see on the left side with the two-part assessment, it becomes very clear and easy to read what those two parts are. And then the findings give a, a good summary of what the results were. And then the recommendations are easy to see on the side. So we have a very clear hierarchy and flow, it's just very clearly represented with a great color scheme. Okay, like let's look at some bad posters. Uh, and, and these are posters, these are just examples. Uh, these aren't posters that students have made. They were designed specifically to look bad. So a uh, big mistake in this poster is the use of a very large image in the background. Um, what that does is it creates a, a dark background with lighter text on it that's hard to read. Um, the colors are also, there are too many of them, so they tend to clash. Uh, we can see that they've used default MS Office graphs and charts that just look like they were, you know, copy and pasted right out of Excel. So it just, it doesn't look very good. It's hard to read. It's really overwhelming. Try to avoid this at all costs. Again, here's another example of a bad-looking science poster. Uh, this one is lacking in images and visual representation of data. So there's like no way for me to look at this in summary. Uh, the person who designed this poster is basically saying, you need to read this whole poster in order to understand what I'm doing. And that's just too much of a burden on the viewer. Again, the, back, the black background with white text makes it hard to read. And everything is in these boxes. It's just a chaotic mix of these different boxes with too many colors. This project could really use some alignment, simplification of color, and introduction of visual elements. And finally, avoid dark colors. You should have a light colored poster, poster with dark text. It's a good idea to include more images and fewer, just fewer, fewer text boxes, because it's, again, too overwhelming makes it very difficult to read. Okay, well that's it for me. I hope this presentation was helpful. Good luck on your poster design.